Peter Gregg writes in How to Pray, <clears throat> he got stuck and stranded in Chicago one evening. All the airplanes had been grounded and because of an eruption on the Icelandic volcano, and he couldn't get back to England, his home. So he asked God um, how he wanted to use this interruption, despite the fact that it was very frustrating and not knowing what to do. And <clears throat> if you've traveled before, when planes get canceled and things happen, it can be you can feel a sense of like, I'm out of control, and I don't know where to go, and I don't know what to do, but instead he prayed. And he found himself thinking about a particular friend who lived about 150 miles west of Madison, Wisconsin. So he gave his friend a call. He said, hey, I'm in Chicago. Uh, can you come, can I come and crash on your couch? I didn't know that Joe had just received terrible news, uh, nor that his wife, or his worried wife had asked, who do you wish you had on your couch right now? And when she asked Joe, her husband, that, he said, my friend Peter. And at that moment was when Peter's call came through. The prophet Malachi says that those who feared the Lord talk with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. Sometimes God listens many times, actually all the time, God listens to us, and sometimes God acts on the prayers and the requests that we have. And does incredible and what we might think is crazy things. And I hope if you're a believer and following Jesus, you've had these moments where you've been praying, seeking God. Maybe you don't know what decision to make. Maybe you're wrestling with something in life. Maybe you're wondering what to do with your kids or your grandkids or a job situation. And you're praying and pouring your heart out to God. And God listens, and God hears, and God does something. Now, not all the time, but many times. And many times he does things that we don't even know or understand, and we won't even know till we stand before him and stand before him in his presence when we pass from this life to the next. The things that we think are unanswered prayers sometimes are answered in entirely different ways that we don't even understand or comprehend. And this morning, as we continue our series through Ephesians, last week we talked about the church in chapter 2, and now we're picking up where we left off almost last week in chapter 3, and Paul is going to pray for the church. And we're going to learn this morning some principles, some ideas, when we ask ourselves this question, well, how do I pray? Because Paul gives us an amazing example here of what it looks like to pray. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verse 7 and following. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 and following, it'll be on the screen. I'm reading from the NIV. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, it says this. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. This is Paul, the person who's writing this letter to the church. Although I am less than the least of all these Lord's people, this grace was given me to me to preach to Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain everyone the administration of this mystery for which ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Remember last week we talked about how this church is now for everyone, both Gentiles and Jews alike, no matter the color of your skin, your creed, your economic status, church, the message of Jesus Christ is for everyone. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This is what prayer is, is the freedom and confidence to approach God and to spend time in his presence. And as we talked about last week, this is new. Before Jesus came, you didn't get this chance. That if you wanted to see God the Father, you couldn't. There's only one man once a year who was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies and he had to do all kinds of offerings and sacrifices and have people outside the temple praying for him just to access the presence of God. But when Jesus came and he died on a cross and he broke the bondage of sin in our lives and he broke the curtain in two and the temple of the Holy Holies is a representation of God's presence is now for all and we can with confidence and boldness approach God in our prayer life. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Paul is not going through an easy time. You might think as we read this in a, the next few verses that Paul's got it great, that he's got it all together, that things are going well. 
But if you know the story of Paul, it's anything but. Paul is wrestling with churches. He's trying to disciple churches. He's got people that are trying to kill him. He ends up in chains. He ends up in prison. He's writing letters trying to disciple churches and steer them in the right direction because there's so many people trying to drag people away from the truth. Paul does not have an easy life. Yet despite that, this is what he prays in verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that his love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him, God the Father, who is able to do immeasurably more than what we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a powerful prayer. There's actually not many like it. In the scripture. And you can sense Paul's compassion and his desire that God would move in his people in this church in Ephesus. That they would know Jesus. That they would know the depth of his love. His character. His nature. And it would transform them. So as we read through this there's so many different directions we could take this, but I think there's just some great principles or some great challenges for us when we look at how do you pray? And so if you're ever one day kind of struggling, like, oh, I don't know how to, this prayer thing, I don't know what it's like, or I'm just confused, or I'm burdened, or I'm stressed, or I'm anxious, or whatever it is, whatever situation you find yourself in, flip open to Ephesians chapter three and just read through this. And maybe you'll remember some of these principles on how to pray. The first principle is pray in the name of the Father. In Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus' disciples come to Jesus, they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus teaches, if many of us know the Lord's Prayer, and it starts with, Our Father, who art in heaven. I mean, you remember if you ever did this when your kids were little. I don't know if my kids remember this, but um, you would take some change out of your pocket, and you would put it in your hands, and you would hold it tight. And your kids would want the change, right? So they would come up and they would try and pry open your fingers to get the change. Am I the only crazy person that did this? And you would torment your kids because you would just hold it tight and you would kind of let them try and pry it open. And eventually, maybe one of the older kids or whatever, they might pry open a finger or two. Couldn't do that now because my fingers kill. But anyways, <laughs> they would pry it open and then they would grab the quarter, the nickel or whatever it was that you had in your hand and they would take off screaming with delight because they won and they got the quarter. They got the, anybody ever done something crazy like that? Good, a couple of you. Good, one of my kids remembers that. <laughs> yeah, probably. Determined she probably would have sat there for 15 minutes until she got it. Sometimes that's how we approach God. We have all these ideas. God, I need a, I need a passing grade. I need some money. I need you to help me study. Uh, I, I need a job. I, my mother's sick. Uh, and so we're like trying to pry these things out of God's hand, these little teeny requests that we have forgetting that our Father is right there in front of us. And it's amazing how in the New Testament, Jesus himself even referred to God the Father many times over and over again. And so when we step into this place, when we begin to focus our attention and begin to talk to God, it tells us to address him as our Father. Abba is the Hebrew word. In the name of the Father. Second thing Paul says here is you can pray for strength. You can pray for strength. Sometimes prayer isn't always what we think it is. Sometimes it's not the, the, the long list that we have, and there's other times where it is of what we need to God do to do in our life. Sometimes it's just, God, would you just give me the strength to persevere? I think this is probably where Paul's coming from because Paul is struggling. 
Paul will be in chains. We'll read later on in many other passages of the New Testament where Paul writes and he's trying to encourage the church and he's suffering. And he's asking for strength from God because of what he's going through. And sometimes we need strength to make the decisions of life. We don't know what to do with their lives. We're at a fork in a road and, and we don't know which decision to make. We don't know which way to go. And sometimes we ask for God for the strength to make the right decision. Jeffrey H. Boyd was a medical doctor in Waterbury, Connecticut. And he wrote this. He wrote that his first wife had diabetes, two heart attacks, bypass surgery, two strokes, was on dialysis, went blind, and had both arms amputated above the knee. How's that for trials? Like, holy cow. She, she and, and so he and he would take his wife every week to a healing service at her church. Hoping and praying that God would heal his wife. And hoping that this prayer would have some sort of miraculous effect and miraculous cure because nobody else could come up with one. But every week, this intimate prayer gave us enough spiritual strength, listen to this, to endure another week. It wasn't like they were immediately healed. It wasn't actually that she ever got healed. But through the prayer, through the laying on of hands of elders, through the community that was around them, as they prayed together, it was like manna, he said, for he and his wife. It gave them strength to go from appointment to appointment, to go from week to week. Sometimes it's not the miraculous Sometimes, as Paul writes here, that you will be strengthened. Sometimes our prayer is, God, would you strengthen me? Because I don't know whether I can handle this. I don't know whether I can go down this path. I don't know whether I have the strength myself to deal with what is in my life, to deal with the situations and the circumstances and the loss and the grief and the struggle and the temptations that surround me in this world. God, more than anything else, Father, more than anything else, I need strength. That supernatural conviction and passion and strength that comes from no one else but the Father himself. Can you imagine Jesus on the night that he was betrayed? The night before he's going to be crucified? And he knew what was coming. It was interesting in watching um, the chosen, the kind of react men in a very artistic different way but I think very decent and really good um, it, we haven't gotten to the, the crucifixion part of the story yet but quite a few times as Jesus and different people walk into Jerusalem there's people hanging on crosses because this is what the Romans did and so the cross wasn't something new for Jesus it wasn't something new for his disciples every time they went to Jerusalem they would have seen people hanging on a cross And Jesus knew that's where he was going. Talk about asking the Father for strength. That your will would be done, not mine, was Jesus' prayer. What an example of of our God, the Son of the Father, who goes to the cross in the strength from his Father. When you're praying, you pray in the name of the Father. You can pray, you can ask for strength. Another illustration I came across this week for strength on a bit of a different note. There was a pastor at Glarenton Road Church in Brooklyn in the United States. He told the story of a a black man who was gunned down by the police in his neighborhood. Anger seethed in that neighborhood. Frustration from years of racial oppression was about to erupt into violence. Many people lined up to march down the main street while police gathered expecting huge violence. Pastors got together knowing where this was going to go and found themselves caught in the middle of the two groups between the police and the people. As the tensions were rising, insults were being hurled across the divide. One side picks up rocks. The other side clutches their guns. The pastors obviously were fearing or began to fear for their lives. 
So what do they do? And one of the pastors spontaneously, in the middle of the street, began to pray. They implored God to visit this place. And as Charles tells it, slowly the tension died down, the people put down the rocks, and the police took their hands off their holsters. Those who cared stayed, and without a shot fired or a rock thrown, conversations began, and God's presence appeared that night in that community. That strength. What else do you ask for when you're in that situation? And it's uniquely different to your given situation and your given circumstance. But the amazing thing about God, the amazing thing about the sacrifice of Jesus is that he has given us the opportunity and the privilege to ask our Father to do something, to ask our Father for strength when we need it. And Paul doesn't stop there. You can pray in the name of the Father. You can ask through the Holy Spirit. You can ask God for strength. You can ask God for power. You remember we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, what are we talking about here? Sometimes it is that supernatural power that does some incredible things where you just feel this inkling all of a sudden you're at work or you're at church or you're in an environment and, and you just know you gotta pray for somebody and you start praying for them and something miraculous happens. There are people that are healed. Not everyone. That's the tapping of God's spirit when he's got a plan for somebody's life and wants to do something, use them for his glory. It's interesting, I was listening to a person talk this week and Peter who walks into Jerusalem walks by a, a man at the temple who's lame and, and he says, get up and walk and, and it's a miracle and it's amazing because Peter inherits that same power that Jesus had to heal people. But the interesting side note was that this man, this lame man was at the, at the temple which meant that Jesus and his disciples probably walked by him before. And Jesus healed others, well why didn't he heal him? And then Peter comes along a few years later, sees him. God's prodding and he asks him to walk and he walks. That's power. And so sometimes there is that crazy like, I don't believe this is happening. I don't understand this. This is the stuff that really freaks us out sometimes because of the supernatural stuff. People that are delivered from things that are healed. But then there's those times where you need the power in a different way. Like over a cup of coffee. In Vancouver, Washington, when the baristas at a Dutch Brothers coffee stand noticed that one of their customers was becoming emotional and breaking down, they went over and asked her what was wrong. Her husband had died the previous evening. So the workers asked her if it was okay if they could pray for her. And after a few moments of these baristas praying for this woman and tears streaming down her face, she felt the peace and the strength of God like she's never felt before. Now what happened was somebody was videotaping this with their iPhone and it went viral. That's a different type of power, isn't it? But equally as valid to find the strength and the courage to step out of your comfort zone and do something that just to the rest of the world berserk and sometimes for even us as Christians and followers of Jesus, we're like, I don't know whether I'm too comfortable with this or whether I really want to do that because it's really putting myself out on a ledge there. And I'm taking some risks that I might not be willing to take. And all kinds of negative things can, like th this is their job, right? Can you imagine in your job, you're, you're serving people and all of a sudden God says to you, I want you to go pray for somebody? I think my first thought would be, well, I'm going to get fired for this. <laughs> right and I got to pay my bills and and we start coming up with excuses right but listen to God's voice ask for his strength and allow yourself allow the Holy Spirit to work through you and his power and incredible things can happen the last thing that Paul says here he says that you may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how high and long and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. He prays that they would have understanding. You know what's cool about God? 
is when you don't understand something, you can ask him for understanding. And he doesn't always answer, but sometimes he does. And the greatest thing that Paul's wrestling with right here is that do you actually, to the church, do you actually understand how deep and how long and how wide God's love is for you? Do you understand what Jesus has done? Do you understand the sacrifice that he's done for you? Do you understand what he's given you? Do you understand the strength and the power that when you call the name of the Father, do you get it? Do you understand it? This is what Paul wants the people to grasp a hold of. Because when you get it, when you understand it, when you begin this relationship with Jesus and you start pouring your heart out to him and you start listening to him and you listen to his proddings and you're spending time in his presence and you're just being at peace with him, man, this is how the church started. This is what transforms lives. Sometimes animals even know when to ask for help. <laughs> when we don't. I read an interesting article this week out of a book, How Smart Are Horses? Apparently, they're pretty smart. Apparently, they did a study on horses to find out how smart they are, and so here's how the experiment worked. First, the researchers placed carrots in buckets that were inaccessible to the horses. Then a human caretaker would arrive, and the researchers observed that the horses displayed certain behaviors that could be interpreted as asking humans for help. Standing near the human, looking at them, touching and even pushing them, they did these things more frequently than in a control group where there were no carrots hidden at all. They found that hiding carrots in a bucket was, the maddening, was, was a maddening inaccessible to horses. They found it maddening and inaccessible, which prompted the animals to actually ask for assistance from their human caretakers. Well, apparently horses are pretty smart. Maybe sometimes smarter than us. I like to do everything in my own strength. You know, I, I'm a fix-it type guy. So if there's a problem, you know, give me some time. Let me try and fix it and try and sort it out and try and figure it out and try and understand it, do some research or whatever, and none of that's bad. But sometimes there's stuff that I don't understand and I might not even ever understand it. Or I need to ask God for understanding Just a quick little prayer that has all kinds of amazing things in it. If you're struggling one day and you don't know what to pray about, then you can open it up and it says here, pray in the name of the Father. Ask God for strength. Ask him for power. Ask him for understanding. It's incredible. It's right there. So let me ask you this this morning. What do you need? As you listen to this, as you listen to Paul pour out his heart for this church in Ephesus, which is for the church of all ages, what is it that you need in your life and in your heart and in your prayer life? Have you ever invited Jesus Christ into your life so that you are forgiven from your sins, so that you can actually address the Father because you are his adopted son and daughter. You're a new creation and you've started this new journey and you've become a believer, you've become a follower of Jesus. That's the first step. Because the moment you do that, the moment you invite Jesus Christ into your life, this is what you have access to. This is how you can pray. This is what God does in your heart and your life. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while, <laughs> maybe a long time, and it's easy to forget what God has done. It's easy to try and solve the problems yourself. It's easy to rely on ourselves and very difficult sometimes to take the risks when we feel God's prodding or when we need understanding when we need power, when we need strength. Rather than relying on God, we go back to ourselves. Maybe you need strength this morning. Whatever your situation is, you're just tired, you're anxious, you're confused. And you need strength from Him. Maybe you need God's power in your life. Maybe you are wrestling with something really difficult. Something's happened in your life. Something's happened in your family life. Something's happened at work, and, and you don't have the power to deal with it. You don't have the right words. You don't have the strength. 
And you need God's Holy Spirit to work through you. To be like the pastors that stood up in the middle of a riot. Or the baristas that in a coffee shop, risking their jobs, got down and prayed with somebody who was mourning. That's the power that God offers you. Maybe you need that. Maybe you need understanding. And this can be in all kinds of facets of life from how you decide where to go tomorrow to what you're going to do with the rest of your life to your career decisions, your family decisions, your spouse decisions, your financial decisions. And you just, you're at a crossroads in life and you just don't know what to do and you need some understanding. You need some divine intervention and some understanding of God's character, his nature, and his desire, and his will for your life. The cool thing is that through Jesus, that all of this is possible if we will humble ourselves and pray. I thought this morning we would do something different, and if you're joining us for the first time, this is different. I haven't done this before. But as I was praying and working on this message, one of the amazing things about being a church and a community, as we talked about last week, is the ability to pray for people and to pray together. Because sometimes you can't do life on your own. I know some of the major decisions in my life, including giving my life to Jesus Christ, was done in an environment with a bunch of people praying for me. Deciding that I was going to become a pastor was not something that I just randomly decided. It was something that some people were praying for me and laying their hands on me and go, and they were praying and they were praying, and it was in those moments that God did something in my heart that I had understanding that I had never had before. And so I've asked our elders, they're going to come forward in a minute, and they're just going to stand in the front. And if you would like prayer for anything, prayer for strength, prayer for understanding, prayer for power, prayer for a relationship with Jesus, whatever it is that you need, then I'm going to invite you in your space, and you're going to come up, and the elders are going to lay hands on you, and they're going to pray for you. I'm going to play some keyboard in the background and just worship, and you can just listen. You can stay in your seats, and you can pray. Or you can come forward and pray and just set up about... 10 minutes, we're going to close up with our final worship song and just give you the space to allow God to do whatever he needs to do in your heart and in your life. And I hope and pray that he meets you. Let's pray before we start. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Father, thank you that we are allowed to be in your presence. Thank you that you give freely of understanding, that you give us freely power, that you give us freely strength. Father, whatever it is that we need to deal with this morning in our hearts and our lives, speak and move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Elders, if you just